So I'm Tony Marisola. I'm a grad student at the University of Illinois. And I've been studying the time scales for axions to condense into Bose stars. So we all know and love the axion because not only could they be a solution to the CP problem in quantum chromodynamics, and not only could they be the dark matter, but they also exhibit this phenomenon where they form compact gravitationally bound structures that are solitons. And other scalar fields like ultralight scalars and axion-like particles also form solitons. So these objects are sometimes called Bose stars or boson stars because the axion field is essentially in the Bose-Einstein condensate phase where all of the axions are in the lowest energy modes. But this uh, exciting story has been challenged in a number of different ways. And one of these challenges that I've been studying asks how long it takes for the axion field to relax into these solitons, into the BEC phase. And so in order to answer this question, we have to understand the initial conditions that the axion field is in after the symmetry is broken and the axions are created. And we have to understand the interactions that the axions are subjected to because it's the interactions that drive the phase transition into the BEC. So the initial conditions is that after the symmetry is broken, the axions form structures called mini clusters, which are gravitationally bound structures, but they're not solitons. And the properties of these mini clusters depend on when the symmetry is broken. So the most common uh, or the most straightforward scenario is called the post-inflation scenario because in this case, the symmetry is broken after inflation has ended. And when this happens, the axion field takes on random values that are uncorrelated in different causally disconnected regions of the universe. This is called the Kibble mechanism, but it is correlated within one Hubble patch. So this causes density fluctuations within those regions of the axion field that are correlated that decouple them from the Hubble expansion. And so this sets the size of these mini clusters. The size is set by the size of the Hubble patch at the time of symmetry breaking. So for the QCD axion, this leads to mini clusters of a size of about 10 to the five kilometers, which is much smaller than the dark matter halos that you get in lambda cold dark matter. So in this state of the mini clusters after symmetry breaking, the axion field is an extremely cold gas, but it's not yet a soliton. But since the temperature is far lower than the critical temperature, we would expect that the field should thermalize and it should reach the thermal state, which uh, can be shown to be a BEC and to include solitons. But in order for thermalization to happen, we need to have interactions because without interactions, we have no phase transitions. So we need to look at the two interactions that the, BEC, that the axion field is subject to. So the first of these is called the self-interaction and it comes from the axion potential shown here. So here the field phi is the axion field, F sub A is the symmetry breaking scale and M is the mass of the axion. And so this cosine potential leads to a quartic interaction with this coupling strength lambda that you can calculate by just expanding this cosine potential. And for the case of the axion, we can calculate what the strength of that quartic coupling is and it's extremely weak. It's something like 10 to the minus 48. And since the uh, axion field is much smaller than the symmetry breaking scales, it's a very weak field, uh, we can really neglect all of the higher order terms. We only have to worry about the quartic interaction. And for other uh, axion-like particles, they have similar potentials and they also get quartic interactions with slightly different coupling constants. So, we might look at this and worry. We would say this interaction is so weak, we might expect that the BEC you know, is stuck trying to thermalize. The axion field is thermalizing for an extremely long time and it might never reach the thermal state where we see BECs and solitons like both stars. But thankfully, there's another interaction, gravity, which is also very weak, but has a long range nature that might speed up this thermalization process. But in order to talk about gravity, we need to take a number of approximations that are thankfully well justified to make uh, discussing the coupling to gravity easier. So the first of these is that we're going to be looking at the classical field limit of the axion field. 
And we can do this because the occupancy number of the axion field, the particle number, is extremely high. And to estimate this, we can look at the density of the axions in and multiply it by the cube of the de Broglie wavelength to get an estimate for the occupancy number. And we get something like 10 to the 26, which is the occupancy number we would expect currently in the universe inside of many clusters. This number would be even higher uh, in the initial conditions because when the many clusters are first formed, the de Broglie wavelength is longer. So because we have a high occupancy number, this leads to small quantum fluctuations in general. But this is precisely true if the field is in a coherent state, because in coherent states, the quantum fluctuations go down like one over the square root of the occupancy number. And it's a reasonable assumption that the axion field is in a coherent state uh, at the formation of the many clusters. So we can replace the quantum field with a classical field, and then it's much more straightforward to talk about how that classical field is coupled to gravity. But there's another approximation we can make, which is that the axions are highly non-relativistic. So to see why this is justified, we need to compare the momentum of the axions to their mass. And the momentum is set by the Kibble mechanism, where the correlations in the axion field are no longer than the size of the, uh, the Hubble patch at, this, at symmetry breaking. So this leads to a characteristic momentum that for axions is something like 10 to the minus 11 electron volts. And this is much smaller than the mass by several orders of magnitude. So we're well justified in treating axions in non-relativistic terms. And we can do the usual mathematical trick where we replace the scalar field phi by a complex field psi that gets rid of all of the quickly oscillating modes. And now we have non-relativistic equations of motion. So those non-relativistic equations of motion for the axion field psi are called the gross pitayevsky poisson equations, because at the bottom we have the Poisson equation that um, deals with the classical Newtonian potential U. And on the top, we have a gross pitayevsky equation that includes the gravitational potential as well as the normal, the, the usual self-coupling, which is this cubic term at the end. So these equations of motion determine the evolution of the field. But in order to see the thermalization into a BEC, we need more information because the thermalization is a statistical process. So we need information about the statistical ensemble that the field is in. And moreover, we need a formalism that is capable of addressing both interactions that are at play if we want to compare them, uh, which, which is the goal. So, we, so there are some formalisms, like if we look at a Boltzmann collision process between particles, this may be valid for the self-interaction, but since the uh, scattering length for gravity is so long, this, this doesn't work when we try to study uh, gravitational interactions. So a formalism that can take care of both processes is that, to look at the Wigner function, which is a mathematical function that defines the statistical ensemble. And it looks like a distribution on phase space, but uh, it doesn't have a straightforward interpretation as a distribution on phase space because it can take on negative values, which is the result of interference between the waves. But still, this Wigner function defines the statistical ensemble. So we can study the evolution equation of the Wigner function by taking a derivative of both sides of this equation and using the gross pitayevsky poisson equations to help us calculate what that is. And we can look for the time scale that that evolution equation exhibits. And that will tell us the time scale for any relaxation into the BEC phase. So when we do that, we get a, uh, an equation which I've written in a schematic form here that splits into two parts, it basically factors, into a term that depends only on the self-coupling and a term that, that depends only on the gravitational constant at lowest order in these two coupling constants. And of course, we're justified in looking at the lowest order because both of these constants are very small. We, we saw how lambda was an extremely small number and of course, the gravitational constant is famously very weak. So when we look at lowest order, we see that there are these two terms that, and there's no mixing, there's no cross terms. And the reason for this is because 
gravitational scattering is dominated by long distance fluctuations. This is actually an observation that was first made by Landau in a different context. He was studying plasmas, which also have a one over R interaction, the Coulomb interaction. And he demonstrated that the, the scattering process in plasmas was dominated by long distance fluctuations. And it's the same story here. But the self interactions are short range interactions. It's a contact interaction. So it ignores the long range fluctuations. And the result is that during the condensation process, at least at the beginning, uh, these two processes don't notice each other. So in order to calculate the time scale for the condensation into the thermal phase, we can basically calculate these two time scales separately and then just look at which one is faster. So we do that in uh, my recent paper. And we show that for um, QCD axions, the time scale for gravitational uh, interactions is something like 10 to the 17 seconds, whereas the time scale for the condensation due to self interactions is much longer, 10 to the 22 seconds. And we can also calculate uh, time scales for different values of the mass and the self interaction and all these parameters. So we could look at ultralight scalars and axion like particles. But, and we would get a similar story that the exact numbers are different. The gravity happens at a much faster rate than relaxation due to self interactions. So we can draw some conclusions from these numbers, which is that first, the condensation process is certainly driven by gravity and not by self interactions. By the time that self interactions begin to play a role in the condensation process, uh, the condensation process is already over because uh, it, we're, we're long past the time scale for the Bose, for the axion field to condense into a BEC due to gravity alone. And next we notice that the, uh, the condensation process can occur within the lifetime of the universe, but just barely since 10 to the 17 seconds is also the lifetime of the universe. And finally, we have a formalism that can address both self interactions and gravity simultaneously. So previously, when people have studied this, they've often calculated these time scales in, in different formalisms separately, and they've said you know, gravity is, you know, is much faster, so we're justified in just ignoring self interactions. But even if we were to imagine a scenario where the self interactions were much stronger than they actually are physically, we could still use this formalism of studying the Wigner distribution to compare the two time scales in a more rigorous way. Thank you.